my mortal friends. Welcome to my Pessimistic Guide to Anti-Aging Research, Episode 15. Today I decided to go all in and discuss existing strategies for healthy longevity and, who knows, perhaps even the ways to achieve biological immortality. The hell with the transhumanism. At least for now. I am deeply enamored with my biological essence, which over the years allowed me to feel and enjoy so many things. Mmm, good times. Therefore, I will not discuss cyborg-style scenarios. <clears throat> I do not value my brain over my body to such a degree. My body and I are very good buddies, and I am very happy with it. Although maybe, in the next incarnation, I would want to be about um, you know, four inches taller, and maybe I would wish to have a less magnificent nose, but more functional one. But these are little things. Another reason is that a uh, long time ago, a great scientist, Ibn Sina, Avicenna, mapped human soul to genitalia. And he still may be right, so to me it's either body and soul together or none, just in case. There are two extremes on the scale of anti-aging activity. Minimalistic approach is preventive by nature as it aims to slow down the aging process through uh, behavioral adjustments, which include diet, exercise, and even youthful mindset. It is, however, relatively weak and is expected to increase lifespan or health span by only a few years within the lifespan limits of the existing design. Even famed caloric restriction is not without controversies. For example, all experiments with caloric restriction were conducted on animals who were fed at libitum or without limitations. Big lifespan extension percentages reported in these studies, up to 50%, are therefore from animals rescued from obesity. In real life, as follows from the large-scale epidemiological studies, both high, more than 25, and low, less than 22 BMIs, uh, BMI values are detrimental to lifespan, while exercise additionally increases lifespan by no more than uh, five years. Altogether, the most we can realistically squeeze out of it is an additional decade of lifespan and probably a couple of decades of health span. The good news is that um, it is immediately available and actionable. There are, however, some additional paradoxes to ponder, like uh, obesity paradox and the results from 90-plus study, which I discussed in one of my previous episodes. The middle ground is fairly crowded, and it is occupied by a variety of interventions. Thanks to relentless efforts of Mikhail Batin, a beating heart of Moscow gerontological community, I'm aware of the latest compilation of uh, progress in anti-aging research and it allows me to reach a number of conclusions. The projects that reached a clinical trial stage reflect a consensus as to what mechanisms are thought to be relevant to aging. Among them, rightfully, are DNA repair, telomeres, mitochondria, epigenetic aging, and accumulation of cellular garbage. A prominent position is occupied by senolytics and stem cell ther therapies. Then there are uh, nutrient-sensing, autophagy, and aging of extracellular matrix. Most trials are evaluating interventions aimed at a single mechanism. Let's take a stock of the situation. Presumably, Accumulation of mutations, shortening of telomeres, mutations in mitochondrial DNA, epigenetic aging, and accumulation of cellular junk contribute to aging independently. Of course, at some level everything is connected to some degree, but we may assume that these mechanisms are largely independent, which I believe is largely true. Our lifespan, therefore, is a result of combined action of these independent mechanisms. Any single mechanism intervention, even if it is uh, effective and neutralizes uh, its contribution, which is usually not a given, 
leaves others intact. So, the probability of positive results boils down to relative timing or the extent of synchronization between various independent mechanisms in terms of uh, precipitating dysfunction. To illustrate my point, let's talk telomeres. The early studies on overexpression of telomerase in mice reported significant increases in incidence of cancers. This suggests that shortening of telomeres has a second useful biological purpose after all, to prevent cells lineages that went through too many divisions and therefore likely accumulated too many mutations from living longer than they should. In that case, lengthening of telomeres is probably not advisable. The present day reports are far more optimistic and in this rosy context, extension of telomeres seems like a viable choice. Regardless, the results from mice have no bearing on us because shortening of telomeres and accumulation of mutations to dangerous levels will have their own human-specific relative timing issues. Or, for example, the reduction of mutation rate may not amount to anything if epigenetic clock continues its relentless advance. Or, modification of both of these mechanisms may not be very helpful if mutations continue accumulating in mitochondrial DNA, and crucial and irreplaceable neurons continue dying out. The main conclusion is that, in the presence of several independent aging clocks, the reductionist approach is not very promising. In any case, the principal feature of our current anti-aging efforts is incompleteness and patchiness with uh, unpredictable outcomes, which, I guess, is an inevitable stage of this endeavor. There is one more thing that I can't help noticing. It's the appearance of stem cells and senolytics in clinical trials, a development that signifies a fundamental shift in anti-aging strategies from biological to biotechnological. This shift may have a number of explanations, but my favorite is this. The successful biological anti-aging intervention implies comprehensive knowledge of the process of aging on molecular, cellular, and systemic levels. This knowledge proved to be not easily attainable. In fact, it proved to be remarkably difficult to attain, big data and silica science notwithstanding. Thankfully, there are ways to solve the problem without knowing the intimate details of the problem. Just the fact of its existence is sufficient. As a result, anti-aging research increasingly adopts alternative methods routinely used by all other repair restoration services. For example, <clears throat> in auto and electronics repair industries, they gave up on the idea of repairing broken parts long time ago, simply because it is not a viable strategy. Instead, they perform repair based on module replacement principle. We do not need to know what exactly happened to the motherboard in our computer. We just replace it. We don't care what exactly ails our gearbox. We install a new one. Likewise, gerontologists finally turn to methods of micro and macro modular replacement. Our cells are micromodules. We don't like senescent cells, we remove them. Our aged cells stop performing well, we complement them with new ones grown from injected stem cells. The replacement of organs is an extension of this principle to a macro modular level. Simple and effective, although not terribly elegant, bypass of our ignorance. But our organism is somewhat more complex than any car or laptop. Therefore, our existing module replacement methods cannot work as efficiently. For example, new cells originating from injected stem cells will still have to coexist with original H cells, with all complications such arrangement implies. Or, it is probably okay to eliminate senescent cells in most places, but I would hesitate to do it in the brain. With the epigenetic rejuvenation, 
It will always be a delicate balance between overshooting. We don't want to de-differentiate de somatic cells too much, especially neurons, and undershooting, which may prove to be insufficient. On the maximalistic end of the scale resides the idea of biological immortality, which in my view is possible only if we use cloning as an approach that allows us to completely bypass all complexities of biological aging. One principle and already resolved component is the establishment, established ability to generate healthy human clones, or at least their close proxies, primates. In terms of bodily health and the return of true youth, this approach in principle is perfect and has a potential for a limitless perpetuation of an individual. However, we still have crucial gaps in basic biological and biotechnological knowledge. We do not know how memories are encrypted and how memories can be extracted, stored, and transferred to a clone. This approach is still somewhere in the realm of fantasy, but it feels like a viable and the only truly effective strategy to work on. In conclusion, and not for the first time, I would like to point at the di dilemma which we cannot solve unless we bashfully recognize necessity of some conventionally immoral decisions. I remember a little sketch by a great Russian Jewish comedian, Arkady Raikin, who portrayed a small caliber hustler. The gist of it was that without being able to get things that are in a short supply, how can one separate himself from the rest? command, respect, and enjoy life. If I have it, if you have it, and even the one we don't like has it too, what kind of society it's going to be when people don't have any reasons to respect one another? I'm all for a life of plenty for everyone, but please, let at least something remain in a short supply. This reasoning rings especially true with regard to immortality. Do we feel any different compared to our ancestors who lived on average half as long? I do not think so. We still feel perpetual discontent that uh, time flies by and that our lifespan of 80 to 100 years are utterly inadequate. Are they going to be, uh, become more adequate at 500 years? 1000 years? Psychologically, it's an idiotic expectation. We will simply accept a new lifespan as a new norm and just another intolerable low. It is a privilege to be young. It is a privilege to be healthy. It is a privilege to live, let alone to live very long. Therefore, to remain a keenly appreciated privilege, immortality must be made available only to the lucky few. Otherwise, nothing makes sense. Are we willing to accept such an arrangement? I know, I know. I'm a very embodiment of optimism. Still. See you next time.